Well, hello, everybody. We're back here with some more information about Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Today, we're going to be focusing on visualizations. It's a broad area. We're going to be talking first with uh, John McNally about visualizations of data, having stored information, maybe a CSV, maybe information that you get from creating it or from Wolfram Alpha and finding ways to see easily, quickly, intuitively what is going on with that. And then I'm going to be focusing more on creating visualizations out of equations, uh, inequalities, equalities, the, the sort of mathematical language that turns into pictures that uh, we all know and love. So. We'll be responding to questions or comments as they come. As always, know ahead of time that we're going to be uploading the documents that we're using here. So we'll do our best to make sure that people can see what is on our screens. But if you can't read every period or bracket, if we're going uh, fast enough that you miss a little bit of the details, you will have access to this later on. So we'll be able to catch up uh, along the way. So thanks for being with us, John. You want to start us off with data visualization? Absolutely. <clears throat> so uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I'm first going to talk about uh, some data that you might use in science classrooms or even in research. Uh, and then go into a little bit more about data that is from the social sciences, um, because it's really important to emphasize that no matter what your field is, uh, you can find some cool things to do with Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So um, using natural language input, uh, just like I've done here, we can access curated data through some query that we have. So if I want to know what are the masses of the planet, um, so we get some nice things here, right? So we get First of all, just what we wanted, which is a list of the masses of the planet. But remember, anytime that you enter a query in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, not only do you get to see what the result of that computation is, you also get to see what's the Wolfram language code that would do that same thing, right? So this is not only a great way to visualize data, but to learn how you might want to visualize data using Wolfram language as well, right? Because natural language is great, there's certain things that might be kind of complicated that are you know, difficult to express in natural language. That's why we you know, have programming languages and things like this that, that have that very detailed syntax. It's why mathematical notation exists, right? So you'll, you'll see a bunch of examples that use um, natural language, and then you'll also get to see some examples that sort of mix the benefits of natural language with adding a little bit of syntax of Wolfram language to be able to sort of get the best of both worlds. And that's one of the cool things about Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition is that you can get the best of both worlds. So um, at any rate, we, we have planet masses. Okay, so that's cool, but it's just a list, right? Raw data is never that interesting uh, unless you're just really, really into numbers, right? So what if I want a pie chart of the planet masses instead of just the list? Well, sure enough, I get a nice pie chart. And notice that this is automatically labeled, right? You'll see that this um, pod that we get when we do a query like this, this is a little bit different than what you would get by doing just the natural, excuse me, just the, nat the uh, Wolfram language syntax, right? Uh, if I wanted to add sort of these labels and, and things, it would be slightly more complicated than just saying pie chart planet masses in Wolfram language, right? Because if you're using a programming language, you don't necessarily want to assume uh, everything about what the, the settings for labels and things like that are. Now, Wolfram language does do a, a good job of having, having automatic settings that for the most part give you what you want. But again, the point of a programming language is so that you can be very precise. But if you wanna just use natural language, uh, this Wolfram Alpha pod goes and says, well, this is a pretty good format for a pie chart and it's probably what you would want. And so here we go. Um, what if I don't want a pie chart? What if I want a uh, bar chart instead? So if I want a bar chart instead, I can just evaluate this and sure enough, I get a bar chart instead of a pie chart. So again, all this was done using purely natural language. We got some nice Wolfram Alpha pods, but I'll talk a little bit more about these yellow things later. These yellow things are part of the entity framework in Wolfram language, and it's worth learning on its own. And I'll talk a little bit more about that 
further down, we get to some advanced examples because you can do some really cool stuff with this. Okay, so we can make pie charts, bar charts, that's good to know. What else can you do? So if you know any uh, anatomy teachers who are in the biology department and they spend a long time drawing up on a board, a very detailed 3D, but on a 2D board, pictorial representation of organ systems, well, then I think they're really gonna like this. So remember to uh, show any biology teachers that you know this functionality as well. So what, what presentation about visual, visualization we complete without showing the visual cortex? So what do I get if I ask for a 3D image of the visual cortex? Uh, oops, excuse me, had a, there we go. Uh, my mouse slipped, but I get a fully rotatable 3D image of the part of the brain that is the visual cortex. Now, I just asked for the visual cortex, so there's not a whole lot of context to understand where this part of the brain is unless you already happen to know. So what can I ask for? I can say, show me the location of the visual cortex. And so we get this, uh, you know, again, this uses stuff that's in the entity framework. This is curated data. To get a nice visualization of where is this thing with the anatomical structure within the body. So I thought this was a neat way to start off a, a visualization presentation. So uh, what if I want to see uh, other anatomical structures? Well, it's as easy as saying, show me that one, right? Um, so after uh, spending a long time away from the gym, I'm starting to go and get into a little bit more exercise routine, as I hope that many of you are as well. And so these muscles are sore for me right now, but here we go. We can see where they are in the body exactly. And then I can even get more detail, right? What if I don't want just one at a time? What if I want some uh, structure that's made of a bunch of organs? So again, I get this rotatable 3D image where I can sort of see, ah, all right, so here's how this particular part of anatomy fits into more stuff. I see where the bones are. I see where major blood vessels are, all kinds of really cool stuff that you can get. Again, natural language tied to the Wolfram language version of how you would get these things and then a very nice output. Um, and then we can even get these sort of 3D graphical regions. So if I ask for this mesh region of the human heart, I can rotate this around. I can also, the, the, so the difference between asking for this and asking for this is that this mesh region is an object which has uh, got some other cool computations that you can do with it uh, that I can maybe show at a later time. But so there's all sorts of different things that are related to these anatomical structures that you can go and visualize. And so this 3D model is much, much, much more informative for students than trying to visualize it only as a 2D schematic, right? Schematics are very helpful, right? Sometimes you, you don't want every gory detail about what you're looking at, but why only have a schematic? You can have a schematic and you know, a real representation of what these structures look like. Um, so another thing that I think is really cool that you can do. So uh, aside from going and getting data that is built into Wolfram language and curated, you can also import your own. You can manually input your own. So importing is something that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. But so for example, here, let's say I've got some pre-test and post-test scores for my class. And so of course, if you're in the classroom and you're wanting to do action research to see is my instructional technique working? Well, maybe you want to do a histogram of what was the post-test scores minus the pre-test scores. And because of the way that Wolfram language is set up, when you ask for this, it will go ahead and automatically go through the list and compute each thing when you ask. For, and this is just asking for it in natural language. And then you get a Wolfram language thing, which does the exact same output. And so we get a histogram. And so we see, ah, this instructional technique, while I did get a shift away from no change in their scores, it didn't work for all my students. So I better go figure out you know, what, what happened there. What do I need to change to make sure that all of my students are seeing gains? Um, so maybe one way I can do that is I can make a list plot instead of just a histogram. So hmm, what if I, now, if I know the order that my data came in, I can use these numbers to sort of ID you know, who's who. And so maybe, maybe I was aiming for you know, my instructional technique. I wanted to see a shift of at least you know, five score points up from whatever the baseline was, but clearly that didn't happen, right? So what if I wanna label this so I can more easily see? So here I've just generated some, you know, sample student names. 
and you might even want to just use student IDs rather than names if you're you're worried about student privacy as you should be. So uh, at any rate, here's a little helpful shortcut. So again, this, this is an example that shows how you can use the best of both worlds when you're you're using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So I ask for this list plot in natural language. And then, oh, I get a list plot. I also get to see, oh, actually the Wolfram language command for this is super simple anyway. So now I just know how this works if I want to pay attention to this part. So there's a nice little shortcut that you can use with uh, many plotting functions, where if you take the thing that you want to plot, so post test minus pretest in this case, and then you say it goes to the things that you want to label, this is a nice shortcut that works with many plotting functions. And so sure enough, you can see if I ask for this, I can do it in a natural language cell. In this case, I used Wolfram language syntax because I saw how that might work here. Uh, I get this nice labeled version that shows, you know, which data point is which student. Now, how, how do you find these little shortcuts? So remember that you can always use built-in documentation if you want to use Wolfram language in addition to natural language. Again, you don't have to use Wolfram language in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, but if you want to, like if there's a shortcut or something that is just a really convenient little thing you can type in, um, you can always in, in input a question mark and then whatever thing you want to know about. So how does labeling function work? So if I do this, I get a quick synopsis of what this Wolfram language thing does. And then I can click this little I thing. And can you all see this new thing that popped up? I can. OK, great, good. So uh, this labeling function, uh, well, I got, so let me do it again then since the, the screen cracked. So this little I right here. So if I want to know how does a Wolfram language thing work, just like I can in, in any Wolfram notebook. Um, so I want to say, all right, how does this thing work? It says, ah, here's a link to the document. Here's a synopsis and then a link to how does this labeling function thing work? And so if I look at like the first example, it says, oh, there's this automatic little shortcut that you can do that says, oh, in some plotting function, if I put my data and then this little arrow and then what I want my labels to be, many uh, plotting functions will just automatically know what you want to do with this label. And then again, you don't have to go deeper than that. You've just learned a nice little shortcut. But if you want to learn other examples, as you go further and further down the page, it'll get into more and more advanced techniques, right? And so you can start to see uh, other ways of doing things. You know, this, this last example this is pretty complicated, but see, we've achieved a kind of complicated result. So when you're looking at documentation and things like this, the details at the top, um, again, these kind of tend to start with the basics and then go into more details as you go down. The basic examples, which I'll open this again, just so that you can see the, the layout from, from fresh. So we get our synopsis. If I look at basic examples, I see some nice, simple examples of how to do stuff. And then if I um, want to get into more complicated examples, generally they're gonna be further and further down. So I can, as complicated, complicated as I like with any of these things. So I wanted to show that just to remind people that uh, when you're using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition, it's a Wolfram Notebook. So you can use natural language to do as much as you want. You can also, if there's a nice little simple shortcut, for example, Maybe I'm not sure what natural language command would give me exactly what I wanted here. So what I can do is I can just go and look up a nice little shortcut in documentation if there's something relatively simple that I want to do. So that's a, a nice way to blend the best of both worlds. I I'd love that other... question mark uh, functionality. Yeah. It, it even will give you information about something that you defined. Like if this we did true. question mark and then the name of one of these data sets, which doesn't have an Im, uh, implicit meaning in the Wolfram language before, it'll remind you of your definition. Anything? Excellent point. Yeah, I think I should show that later, actually. That's an excellent point. Yes. So this little question mark, you don't just have to do that with things that are built in. After you define something, as Noah said, you can use that too. Yeah, great I've point. got an example of that in my okay, uh, section. Cool. So awesome. stay tuned. Good. You'll see that. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. So you know, th this is a nice little application. I, I did things like this many times after I was, uh, so I, I was uh, uh, teaching and many times my role would be to, you know, sort of try to find students that for whatever reason were not getting the first layer of instruction and to then try to figure out, okay, so what additional instruction and supports can we give these students so that everybody is showing learning gains? And so doing analysis like this is really handy for trying to identify, all right, we just, we just did an instructional sequence 
who did it not work for so that we can figure out why and do something about it. So, you know, the, the data that you're using doesn't just have to be sort of data out there in the wide world, which of course is easy to access using natural language here, but you can also use your own data and analyze it to see what's going on in your local context. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so I, again, I promised there would be examples from the social sciences as well. So uh, here's, we can get uh, economic data as well. So what if I wanna get country population versus GDP? So what happens if I get this? I get this giant list of all the, so all the countries, dependencies and territories that are known. And then I got the population and GDP just by asking for this. Okay, now this is a hugely long list. This can get a little obnoxious to have sitting in the middle of your notebook. Even though I want this data, I don't necessarily want to see it every time I'm scrolling through. So there's a nice little trick that I think you've seen before in some of our live streams, but I just wanted to show you. So just like with any notebook, if you have something that you did and you don't really want to see the output anymore because the output was gigantic, you can go over here to this little bar next to where the uh, cell that you just asked for your thing, whatever it is, happens to be. And I can just double click this and now the output is hidden, right? It's still there, right? So if I want it, I can double click again and I can see it. But after I've got it, maybe I wanna hide it because I don't to do something with this giant list of however many countries there are. I really don't need to see this every time in my notebook. So I can just hide this away and have a nice readable notebook. And even with it hidden, I can say, I wanna set my example data equal to that. And again, I'll get this nice long list that then I can hide. And we've got um, you know, a more readable document now, even though now I've defined this example data um, for later use. So then, okay, let's visualize it. I wanna use list plot. Hmm, well, when I plotted this, I see that everything is kind of clustered down here. So maybe I actually don't wanna just do a list plot. Maybe I wanna do a plot with log axes. Now there's a lot of ways of doing that. You can just use list plot and get that, but there's also this kind of cool little shortcut that you can do, where if I say list log log plot, there's just a nice built-in Wolfram language function that does that. Again, this, this function is basically just a shortcut for something that you could also do using this function in a slightly more complicated way. So anytime that you're doing anything with Wolfram technology, there's usually a lot of different ways of accomplishing the same output. And which one you choose is gonna depend in part on what you're familiar with, in part on the, the context and the situation. But you know, I just wanted to show another example of how there's a, a, a function called list plot. If you know that you just want log axes, you can ask for list log log plot and get that just right away. Um, so what if now, so what, what do we see what's the educational context that we would use this in? So if I wanna see population versus GDP, I've already taught my students that GDP is sort of a measure of the output of an economy, one of several that you could use. But we, what we see, again, you just list, so let me, let me go back to the original. When I just asked for the data, there's very little chance that we would be able to figure out what's the pattern here from staring at this giant column of data, right? This is why visualizations are great. It's because staring at a giant column of data, I've already forgotten what the beginning of the data said. There's no way I'm gonna be able to make sense about that. So what we do is we visualize. Um, and if I do this kind of visualization, I see that there is actually a fair amount of range in where my data goes with a lot clustered down here. Anytime we see a pattern like this, making log scaling for the axes can be kind of important. So that's something, again, that can be a learning goal for our students. We can start, by asking for something like this and then saying, can you think of a way to make this visualization even more readable? And tying in with the math course that maybe another instructor is teaching where they're learning about logarithms that same year, you can say, well, here's a great example of using logarithms in the real world. I've got this actual data, but the numbers are not really friendly to visualize. I don't want everything clustered down here. It's hard to read. So I can use log scaling on my axes and I see, ah, generally speaking, the larger the population of a particular place, the more economic output that they have. Okay, well then I can say, is there some other metric, right? And as part of your economics class, you can talk about per capita GDP. Um, and then, so this is, again, I asked for a natural language. What's the country population versus per capita GDP? I'll get back to these entity things that are in Wolfram language in a little bit later, because we'll, we'll see some other examples where, you know, 
you're not only limited to natural language. If you want to just get in here and work with the entities, you can. So I've asked for per capita GDP instead of the um, uh, nominal. And then we can do the same sort of thing. I can just use my list log log plot and we get this nice thing. Remember, we already learned a nice shortcut for being able to automatically label stuff because the next obvious question is, okay, we see that when we measure the population of a country compared to the per capita GDP, there's a different pattern than if we just use the overall GDP. So how can I understand this data? Remember that little shortcut that we saw above. If I just say, here's my data, here's what I wanna label it with. And so in this case, I wanna label it with all the country dependency and territory names. I'll, in a later section, go into a little bit more detail about what this part right here is doing, because this is a Wolfram language thing that I did. I just wanted to show this in here too. Again, I really wanna emphasize, you can mix natural language and Wolfram language syntax for really cool results. So uh, by using this little shortcut, we've got our labeled thing. And notice that it already knew to make tooltips for the stuff that wouldn't fit, because if I tried to make a little call out, this little, stick with a name for everything, that would also be a mess. So the algorithms uh, underlying the computations being done are smart enough to say, well, let's do the ones where it makes sense to show the name. And then those are the ones where there's room. And then for the ones where there's not room, we'll just give you a little tooltip so that you can hover over any particular one and see exactly which country is related to that data point. Okay. And then- so Hopefully uh, that answers the question in the chat about, hovering over and getting labels, that this is this is the way to activate that sort of functionality. Yep, this is one way to do it automatically. Um, maybe a little bit later, um, I can whip up an example where I can show you, uh, you know, how you would get tooltips for all of them. Um, but in, in many cases, this will be handled autom automatically in an intelligent way, just because the automatic option settings are pretty good. Um, so again, if I, so let me uh, evaluate some of these a second time so that you can see how I got this other label. So when I evaluate this, I'm gonna get my huge list I don't actually want. I'm gonna set the name second example equal to that giant list that I don't actually want to see. It's there, but I don't wanna see it. Um, and then let's say that I want to do my list log log plot of the second example. So it's gonna redraw my thing real quick and it's done. So now if I go, Actually, I think, excuse me, let me do this, get my suggestions bar. So if I click right here, uh, I turn mine off by default because, you know, some people really like having the suggestions bar every time, but some people don't want the suggestions bar every time. So uh, I had mine off by default, but if you click this little arrow, you can get your suggestions bar, even if you have it off by default. Uh, if you don't have it off, this will just show up for you automatically. So now let's say that I want to take this thing and I want to add a label to this. So I want my plot label to be, um, to, uh, well, I'll, I'll type out the whole thing. So the whole thing was population versus GDP, right? And so then I can say, yep, I'm done labeling. And then we will get a nice labeled, I didn't accept my click the first time, there we go. Um, a nice labeled population versus GDP. So I, I can do all kinds of customization of what it's showing by going into the suggestion bar. So the suggestion bar is something that I'm not going to spend a huge, amount, a huge amount of time talking about today. But I just wanted to remind everyone that it's there, right? So if I do anything uh, and I want to get suggestions for what to do more, I can use the suggestions bar. So I'm going to go ahead and turn mine back uh, minimized so that uh, it's not in my way for other stuff I want to do. But again, very easy to either bring back or make go away temporarily. Okay, so um, let's say that I want to look at even more economic data, right? So uh, let's say instead of looking at all countries, I want to look at uh, this group of countries that's called the group of eight. So I can ask for this statistic related to them. I get my list. Let's say I want to do a whole bunch of data compared to each other. So let's say that in that group of countries, I want to look at the Gini index, the per capita GDP, and the population. So again, I've asked for this in natural language. I see how this is being gathered in terms of entity frameworks. And uh, I get an output, which again, okay, this is a cool matrix. It shows, uh, you know, Gini per capita GDP, excuse me. Um, yeah, 
per capita GDP and population. Uh, so I don't want to just carry this matrix around. So let me just give that a name. And then um, I want to make a bubble chart of that, right? So I take my third example uh, variable that I defined. I say make a bubble chart of that, and I get a cool bubble chart. So again, if you want to dive deeper into learning Wolfram language, you always can. You don't have to. So let's say that I want to know, tell me more about bubble chart. So I can go and I can look. I can read all about bubble chart. I can see that, oh, wait, I can actually get colors and things like this by, by changing some uh, options. I can do all kinds of cool stuff if I want to do that. So you can do some of this with suggestions bar. You can also, if one of your goal, learning goals is to also learn a programming language, which maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You can do some nicely formatted stuff by changing a couple options, right? So let's compare this to what I got just by asking for a bubble chart. So by asking for a bubble chart, I got just a bubble chart that uses this function. Now I know what to go look up if I want to learn more. And this little eye right here will also get you to the same place. You don't even have to use this question mark thing. You can, if you just hover over here, you get this little eye that you can click and you can see as well. Um, so then if we um, you know, read a little bit about it. And I say, all right, so rather than just asking for a bubble chart, I want to change these two options. So I get a legend and I get some different colors. Very easy, right? So by starting with natural language, remember all the data here and the name of this variable was set using natural language. And then I said, you know what? This is cool, but I actually want to learn some Wolfram language. I don't want to only use the suggestions bar, right? My learning goal is to not only get cool outputs. My learning goal is to also learn a programming language. You can do that. And so we've got a nice example here. Um, OK, so this is a, a very advanced example, which I'm, I'm actually going to breeze through. It'll be in the full version. Um, but you know, let's say that I want to not just visualize three things at a time. I want to visualize four statistics at a time. I can't draw things in four dimensions, or can I? Um, so we can go and we can get all this data. We can use a 3D bubble chart where now uh, if we go back and look at what we were aiming for, so I was aiming for the Gini index, the GDP nominal, nominal per capita, public spending on education as a fraction of uh, the, or excuse me, the total public spending education, the fraction is a little bit later, and then the population of a country. I can use this kind of chart so that I can see my data along different axes. I can see a fourth dimension of data by the size of the bubbles that I get. And so we can see some really cool patterns. Now I can, this was all done using the entity framework that I'll talk about for just a moment before moving on. So if I go and I get any of these, right? I can, all this is copy and pasteable. So this is the Wolfram language that would get me this. So I can say, well, what if I don't wanna use that third entity? And you can even hover over these and if you hover over these nice yellow things, these nice yellow things are formatted so that it's sort of nice to read on a page. But you can also, if you hover, there's a tool tip that says, if I want to type this as text in like an input cell or something, that's what I would type. So let's say that I want these four statistics. So Gini, GDP, and population. So I asked in natural language for these, and I got this list of these, but then I said, oh, I actually, I don't want this to be the total public spending, I want this to be some sort of fraction of something else. So what I can do is I can take this, where I've got these three statistics I access through natural language, and I can go and I can type in one of these other properties. Again, I'm not gonna dwell on how you learn about these properties uh, in too much detail today, but I just wanna draw everyone's attention that this is a really cool feature that is really great for getting data, and using natural language can help teach you how it works. So that's a really interesting application that I think is great. Um, so anyway, we get a, a more complicated example. Uh, you can see more of exactly the steps to do this. Oh, one of the other one other thing I want to do so using natural language. Let's say that I want to take the public spending on education and divide it by the population of each country. That might not be a statistic that anyone has actually measured. It would be a derived uh, quantity. So if that's the case. I can just ask for it in natural language, and what we'll get is exactly that derived quantity. Right. So if I just ask for this, maybe no one has collected this statistic before, but if it's something that is nice and easy to say what it is that I want, we get this computed for us. Right. So we went to all the group of eight countries. 
we took their public spending on education and we divided it by their population. And sure enough, the data that I get is measured in money spent per person per year, which is exactly what we asked for. And this was done just using natural language. So I can use natural language to calculate new statistics. Um, of course, you can also do it using the entity framework, right? But I can just ask for it in natural language and there we go. Um, so then uh, this is the part I won't dwell on. So you can do some data manipulation and get a nice other bubble chart that shows um, the new things that we just asked for. So now the size of each bubble is this new statistic that we computed that maybe wasn't reported anywhere explicitly, but we could derive it from other data. Um, okay, but there's lots of other stuff we can do. I don't wanna spend the entire time talking about any one area. So uh, let's say I wanna visualize vector fields. We had some questions last week about, you know, how do I uh, visualize uh, stuff in 3D. So if I want to learn a basic concept, I can just say something like plot a vector field, and I get this output that also has some adjustable things. So I can change, uh, let me get my vector field thing, and let's say I want to do, instead of this vector field, let's say I want to alter it and compute that vector field. Now I get a slightly different looking one, right? So I can learn the basic concept and some of the, um, patterns and things like that, maybe in lower dimension, because often having students work in lower dimension first is a nice idea. But then when I'm ready, I can explore the applications of some basic concept like a vector field. So I can ask, what's the point charge uh, electric field? So this is a physics application, a point charge just meaning like a little uh, electric charge sitting around. What kind of electric field do I get from that? So if I ask just for this, I get a nice calculator. It also shows me formulas. Now, um, if you remember from your physics classes, uh, in this formula, and you get a nice little hovering thing where if I look over anything in the formula, it tells me what the variables are. So let's say that I want to look I at, love that. Uh, yeah, this is, this is great. Let's say I want to look at electric potential. So that's this variable right here. And okay, this is just a constant. This has to do with charge. And this has to do with distance away from the, the origin where I'm measuring. So by hovering over these things, I can see, oh, okay, so this part is just a constant. It's going to affect the units, but it doesn't really affect the geometry. This part depends on how much charge I'm looking at. So let's say I just want to explore the geometry now. I can define my own function, say, uh, so again, this is leveraging a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge. I can say, what is the distance in 3D? So the distance in 3D is the square root of the sum of the squares. So I can set a function equal to that. I can either do that for my students or I can have them do that on their own because I've already taught them that as one of the learning goals and I'm, I'm testing to see whether they remember. So anyway, we can define some function that captures just the geometry of this electric potential. And then I can use density plot uh, to see what's the density of my electric potential over some region. And so it intelligently chooses what region might I wanna look at uh, again, this is a, a 3D graphic. So like anything in a notebook, I can zoom around it. This has spherical symmetry. So when you look at different directions, it's actually not that exciting. You'll see another example that's not sphere spherically symmetric in a second. Um, okay, but so now more physics knowledge. If I want to look at uh, not the electric potential, but I want the field line, that's related to minus the gradient of my thing. So in natural language, I can say minus gradient of this. I guess this is technically mixing natural language and mathematical notation. I've just said gradient because I didn't want to go and find the typeset thing. Um, I stuck in a minus sign and this sort of, you know, I think half of these three variables kind of counts as math notation. Uh, categorization up for debate possibly, but using some mix of natural language and math notation in a cell, we get the gradient, exactly what we wanted, right? The gradient in three dimensions of this 3D function. I can set my electric field equal, equal to that. And then I can get a 3D vector plot of that electric field. Again, in uh, a spherically symmetric situation, the field is, of course, spherically symmetric. I get a sense for where the field is stronger by, based off of the color of these vectors. And there's all kinds of cool options. So if I you know, look here, um, I can go and I can get all sorts of information about doing different things with what do my vectors look like. But um, again, not going to dwell on that part you can dive into any of these areas as much as you want to. Um, okay, so what's, what's a, the geometry of some slightly different situation? Well, uh, let me define this other electric potential. Um, this happens to be uh, where you have uh, two charges that have opposite sign, but the same amount of charge in both places. Um, 
So again, this is just a little bit of background physics knowledge. Uh, you can test your students on that in whatever way you want to. But once I've defined my potential, I can just ask for minus gradient of that function. I get it computed. I can ask for a 3D vector plot of that. Now, there's something cooler happening because it's not just spherically symmetric, right? I can see that the field lines are pointing away from this region over here, and they're going toward this region over here in this really interesting way that is probably familiar to you. If you've studied bar magnets, there are a different kind of field that has a similar sort of shape, but electric charges in this particular configuration should sort of remind you of that, even though it's a little bit different principle going on. Um, so, you know, 3D is all well and good, right? It, we, we get a great sense for how this works, but occasionally spotting patterns actually is nice if we just want to do like a slice to this 3D thing. So if I want to see a particular slice, let's say that I want in my function, the Z equals zero plane, I want to set that third argument just to zero. If I ask in natural language for a vector plot of minus the gradient of this thing, where now there's only two actual variables and I've set a constant to the other things and just get a slice, it sort of automatically interprets that in the most natural way. And I can see instead of the 3D image, which is really cool, but might not be immediately obvious to a new student what's going on. Ah, here's a slice through that. I've got field going away from one charge and going toward the other. And then I've got this sort of looping structure uh, away from where the charges are. So I think that's some really cool applications of looking at, at vector fields. I can also ask for density plots of this, um, you know, two charge situation as well. Now, again, remember that when you're asking for something using natural language, uh, many of the option settings are set automatically. In this case, I didn't want everything to be in one color because I wanted to, I wanted to sort of show that the charges are of two different uh, uh, signs. And so I can always go and I can just easily change like one option. And then I get to see what does the electric potential look like in this density plot. Okay, so uh, I've, I've taken a whole bunch of time. I wanna make sure that uh, we get to all the great stuff that Noah's gonna show and also have a chance to answer some questions. So I can also get text so I can study text computationally. Um, I thought this was an amusing example. You can look at a word cloud of the Magna Carta compared to uh, the US constitution. So you can see uh, interesting patterns there. And again, how did I know to use this particular thing? Well, I asked for the text in a uh, natural language cell and it tells me, ah, the way that I can get this particular text is just through this little simple command. And I say, well, that's easy enough. I can just ask for a word cloud of that and get it. And then I can say, um, maybe there's other texts in there. Let's put in US constitution. And sure enough, that's in there too. And I get a word cloud of that. Uh, and one last thing that I wanna show off, so there's financial data that you can get. So if I want uh, the Dow Jones from 2019 to 2022, I get a time series, I can visualize it, get a nice plot. Notice that I just said, let's, let's do this again, just to see how this works. So I want this time series of Dow Jones. I just wanna plot that. I don't wanna worry about how you're gonna plot it, just plot it. It goes and it automatically picks a, a plot that's appropriate. This is a time series with dates. So we get a time series that has the dates. Um, and then this is a cool feature I only learned about recently myself, but I think it's great. So uh there's uh, interactive trading charts that you can do if you want to and it takes a second to load but you know you can uh adjust what time window you're looking at uh you can go and put other indicators so let's say that i want to uh not just have my chart let's say i want to put in like a simple moving average i click add and boom there it is this is just a really cool function that i only learned about recently um, but I love it. I just wanted to show it off as sort of the last visualization of data. But this is just scratching the surface of all the, the various types of data that you can visualize uh, using Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. So uh, I was a little long-winded there. But there's, there's a lot of different data that you can show, and Noah's going to show you even more. So uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, and uh, if there's any pertinent questions, we could do that, or Noah, if, if you're ready to go into yours whenever you want to. Yep, I'm just, just checking for some questions. There was a question about 3D huh. printing anatomical structures. I know that most things that can be graphed in the Wolfram language can be 3D printed, but I don't know enough about 3D printing to give any details on that or any restrictions on it. So I, I'm in the I'm in the same situation there. Yeah. You you can export those things in a lot of different file types. Um, that's not something I have personally done before. So I'm not sure how to do it live, but 
I can look into that because I'm sure that that is possible, yes. There was also a question about using uh, syntax to uh, refine or improve search results in Wolfram Alpha or Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Now, I understand the question. That, like, for example, in Google, you can uh, ask it a question saying, um, uh, Twitter minus website. Like, if you're interested in the sounds that birds make and you're not interested in the social media website. Um, and the answer is there are a lot of ways to refine searches in natural language cells, but it's usually not with a special symbol because mathematicians assign meaning to almost all the special symbols, don't they? I mean, you know, if, if, Wolfram Alpha took minus to mean not, then it would get confused an awful lot of the time when someone was trying to do math in it. Um, we are going to go into ways that you can refine searches in our next live stream. But uh, it's a I also wanted question. to show another way that you can preserve some of these things. So let, let's say that you want to make all this stuff in a notebook, but then you want to present it in some other way. Um, so if you want to take any particular thing, there's of course. Uh, you know, like export functionality, you can also, so let, this is my labeled thing, population versus GDP of all this stuff. If I just right click this, um, I'm not sure if you can see what comes up when I right click, but there's a save graphic as, right? So we, we can, you know, do all the usual stuff that you would expect with the graphic, um, you know, right from this interface. So uh, that, that's another thing that I didn't show the first time I was going through, but if there's any like one thing that you want to save in some random file format, um, generally right click save ads is going to do what you think it would do. Okay, let's see what other questions we had. Um, doo -doo -doo. I think those were all the questions that I see at the moment. So I'll, I'll also keep an eye on chat, see if there's any more questions. But Noah, if you'd like to go into um, some more mathematically oriented visualization. Yep. 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 Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, ah, excuse me just a second. Sharing my screen. There we go. So the everyone see the notebook mm -hmm. that I'm sharing? Great. My notebook that I'm sharing today is based on a few of the starting point notebooks. Exploring uh, implicit functions is the first one of those, and polar plots is the second. But I've added a few things of my own. So uh, if you're familiar, that's the difference wanted to start off by re-emphasizing that what we're doing today in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition is different from what you can do in Wolfram Alpha in a lot of cases. John showed quite a few examples where he defined a set or a variable or a function that didn't have a definition before and then did something with it. That's something you can do in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. Like, for example, here I'm setting f of x equal to 2x plus 3. You get code that then does that formally for you. And then I can tell the program to just plot my function or to do something with it. Uh, for example, plot y equals that squared. And you see, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly what you'd expect. And like I said before, that wonderful question mark functionality that John showed off before, which I'm hitting shift and enter because this is an input cell. So, oh, I have to redefine this because I cleared it before this presentation. There we go. You can now tell that the function is defined because it's turned from blue to green. That's another handy way to know that everything's going correctly. And now that I've defined it, there, it popped its definition into that question mark field. So if you ever forget what it is, it's right there for you. I'm going to clear it again, just so that no 
following code uh, that relies on F gets messed up. Notice now F has gone to blue, meaning they don't know what it is. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it doesn't all have to be curves on a uh, two-dimensional axis, by the way, starting here with a uh, inequality in one variable, the best way to plot that is, or more specifically, the way that we're requesting it is a number line plot. And it gives it to us as requested. You can plot with more than one variable, of course. Here's saying plot x squared plus y squared equals four. And notice, um, although I said plot before and plot again now, which is a really great term for Wolfram Alpha. They understand quickly that you're trying to do visualizations. It's jumped to a contour plot here, understanding, oh, well, based on the nature of what you gave me, I think this is probably the best way uh, to describe it. And you can also introduce dynamic elements into your system. Now, you'll notice right here, although the equation is the same, the picture is very different. And that's because, whereas before it went from the field x goes from negative 6 to 6 and y goes from negative 6 to 6, this time um, it has decided, oh, well, x just goes from negative 2 to 2. And based on the sort of dynamic thing introduced here, I think that's going to be uh, important to lock it in there. And so a few things are different about this. The, but I want to point out that this, this code that's generated here, it's not just for archival purposes. This code is, as we've mentioned in previous videos, is editable, live, and runnable. I can take a look at how the range and domain of this is defined change it, hit shift and enter. And now, yeah, it looks it's just the way I would expect it to. And varying that one little variable multiplied by y to various sizes changes it from a circle into various other shapes. You might notice the little bit of, oh, excuse me. That to save time and computation, it doesn't draw every curve in until you stop, but you get a basic sense of how it's going to look. That's, that, that's an automatic setting. You actually can change that yep. setting if you want to for whatever your purposes are, yep. right? It's, so you, you can set your, your goal for, do I want fast or do I want more accurate or somewhere in between? Yep, different ones work of, for different things. Um, I just personally happen to like this particular contour plot, so I uh, wanted to include, include it, but you can draw multiple curves in on the same result. And of course, plot things in three dimensions. And in this case, even set an opacity in natural language so that you can see what's going on through the various layers. <clears throat> Styling's a thing too. Like I can change the color if I hadn't included the instructions in green here. It would have automatically selected, excuse me, a color that it thought was appropriate. Going to put in green back just to show very intuitive placement of that instruction. And I like this example where the variable that we're changing is not something that's being multiplied directly by one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the manipulatable parameter is not being multiplied by or added to the variable directly. It's the thing that they ultimately sum to and changing this weird tooth-like structure that occurs out of that. I'm just a fan. 
Here's an implicitly defined two-dimensional region, not just curves, not just three-dimensional shapes, but you can give yourself regions with inequalities. Here's a sphere defined by uh, an equation. But keep in mind, this program will understand you if you don't want to use equations as well. I can say plot a sphere of radius 8. And there it is. Nice looking sphere. Though I liked it better when the axes were in this. So I'll just um, add the instruction show axes. And it does. And I get to see what's going on there. Um, can start combining these concepts, show a three-dimensional region defined by an inequality. So not just the three-dimensional surface, but anything that's under it is included in this diagram. Um, and I can play around with the appearance of multiple elements at the same time. Like here's a plane, a set of, a combination of two planes, z equals 2x and z equals 3y. Now, of course, everyone who's watching these videos are mathematical geniuses, so we all know which plane is which, but a student who's looking at this might get a little uncertain. I, I could add labels to this if I wanted, but personally, I'd find it more handy to just take exactly the same instructions, but just put the words red and green after the two uh, planes respectively. And then, oh, OK, here we go. The z equals 3y is green, so that must be that other one. So now we can clearly see what's got. Well, mostly clearly, one of the planes is sort of hiding the other for part of it. So now I'll say same instructions, red, green, but also add that I want the second one, the green one, to be transparent. And now I get exactly what I wanted to see. Uh, nice graphical representation of these two things where I can clearly tell which one is which and I can see everything that's going on. And let's bring some of these things together, can create a three-dimensional graph with a dynamic variable. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, a very simple line of instructions, but then bringing us to this Nice little shape where since it's the cosine of a times x squared plus y squared, it's basically a curve whose height is defined by the horizontal distance it is from the z-axis. And the a factor in here multiplies this whole thing. So the larger that gets, the more quickly changes in x and y affect the graph, and so it makes tighter and tighter ranges of ripples. If I felt so inclined, I could give A a wider, oh, excuse me, I put the four in the wrong place there. Um, I told it there to start A at the value of four, which it's done for me, but it's also showing me a red saying, wait, you're going outside of the parameters. You said A should only go from between zero to two. So now I'm changing that, saying let let's have a go from zero to four, so we can see. And notice that this is a great way to. So the the input that originally got that was just natural language. I want to vary a, and the automatic settings pick something that was intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, but then you can see how easy it is to go in and change them and sort of explore what what do each of these things mean, um, so that you yep. can you can customize as much as you want. I I love this as a tool for teaching code as much as anything. Mm -hmm. um, And here's just a demonstration someone else created of, <clears throat> excuse me, cubic curves with sliders for every single coefficient for all the combinations of x and y to the various powers in a cubic curve. And you can see all the different ways within certain ranges that these results could happen. Uh, I love the thought of a student being able to just play around with this and seeing what happens in that. Then creating assignments that ask them, can you explain why changing some of these variables does one thing reliably or 
um, how it changes what. I, I think it's giving students the ability to look at thousands of different configurations within a couple of minutes and see what they see. Want to point out the visualizations that you can use and run into aren't just ones that you create yourself. There are a lot built into this system. John showed some great ones with the uh, um, brain and muscular structures, but it also is something that sometimes gets used as part of something else. Like here's one of my favorite step-by-step -step solutions to a problem, show steps, uh, limit of sine of x over x as x goes to zero. Now, anyone who knows uh, L'Hopital's rule will be able to solve this pretty quickly. The answer is one. And the step-by-step -step solution could have shown that. It, it, it could have said um, just that and been done with it. But because there happens to be a cool visual way to find out what's going on here, this step-by-step -step solution includes it. Shows, uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but it shows... <clears throat> excuse me, a sector of a circle, points out the area of it, a triangle inside of it, pointing out that area, then a smaller sector that comes in, um, just sort of kissing the height line that's drawn in there, pointing out through uh, these various areas, what happens as X uh, goes, um, to zero that the that this one may not be uh, definable, but these certainly are. And then just gives you a simple thing saying, well, it's less than or greater to one, and it's also greater than or equal to one. So it's one. It's absolutely got to be that. Also, you can find things that don't have visualizations by default, but then expand the nature of your search. Like if I say these two, I say I want the sum of these two vectors. The default solution is just to give me exactly what the answer is, of course, because I asked for the sum, it gave me the sum. But if I want more information about it, I can click on full Wolfram Alpha results, which I did. That's how I got that little spiky uh, symbol coming out of it. And now it not only shows me the some, but other information about it, length and the normalized vector, and also this nice little visual depiction of the two vectors that I added together to make the third vector. This is, this continue, oh, continues to be something that I enjoy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, Oh, right. I, this is something I added in for a second to remind myself of the explanations for the step-by-step -step solutions we were looking at before. I'm going to go over some polar coordinates examples as well. I um, want to point out that, like we said before, Wolfram Alpha is uh, and Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition are very intelligent in how they interpret our prompts. But sometimes we do need to be a little more specific. Like if I say plot r of theta equals cosine of two theta, by the way, if you're wondering how you get theta, you can find it from the typesetting tools up in the header ribbon up here. You can go to special characters and then you'll find most of the kinds of characters that you are likely to need in mathematical <clears throat> excuse me, calculations. Um, but uh, but when it starts off, maybe a human being might look at this and say, well, R is a radius, right? But the computer isn't going to jump to that conclusion. It says, well, people define functions with all sorts of letters. I'll just graph this as a function, which is two, uh, cosine of two times the variable. So to be a little more specific, I can say, no, no, no. I mean, it's a polar plot computer. I'm looking for something where the radius is this. And then we'll say, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. So we can plot that, no sorts of problems there. One one thing I always used to like to tell my students is that variables don't care what you call them, right? And so um, neither do functions. So, yeah, neither do functions. So when, when you say plot this, right, 
like there you're you're only as a person maybe having some you know preconceived notion that when you use r and theta those mean polar coordinates right and so mm -hmm. since variables don't care what you call them if you just ask for a plot sure plot variables but if you had that notion of oh wait no i meant polar plot there you go um <clears throat> the examples can get a lot more complicated of course um throwing in uh the variable multiplying it as well as being part of the function uh, in here. It's all part of the function. You know what I mean, though, that allowing things to happen more quickly, more confusingly, more interestingly. And I'll I'll skip past these lines for just a second because I put them in for something else. Um, and let me just hit enter here because I left my completed example live. You can also plot more than one polar plot element at once. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is something that is going to take it a little bit more time to think about. Excuse me as I... Oop. Just going to stop that process because it's created the image that I wanted. Can everyone uh, see the orange and blue outputs there? Having a small delay with your, your video, I think. Excuse me for just a second here. Just minor glitch as I look at that. But I go. want to point out, um, I could tell it to do exactly what I did before with those two planes and say, how about you make this one red and this one green? Now, like we said, it's very good at interpreting what you want, but sometimes it will jump to the wrong conclusion. It can say, well, these are pretty complicated. You want them on two different plots, right? And so now I did not. And so I'm going to want to be revising that, but I have a way to do it. I've put in a simple example of doing this with two simpler lines. And you can see here that the code it created put an element called plot style at the end of the code, after everything else and before the final bracket. And that's how it in interpreted what I wanted to do and got it to do it all in the same thing. So I learning from the other code that I see, could throw that into the mix, excuse me, and it'll give me exactly what I wanted to see. Um, now, of course, everything that we're doing here is just scratching the surface, absolutely um, just beginning to show you what, <clears throat> Uh, what these programs can do. And if you'd like to see more, and I'll include um, a link to this in our document, but if you'd like to see more, you can go to, amongst other places, reference.wolfram.com, having searched for visualization. And I I love this little Thing that we have here, a list of all sorts of functions that describe different ways to visualize data, especially relevant to the sort of things that John was talking about, and also shows you examples of what those sorts of visualizations look like. I've seen a few other coding languages where they had decent documentation describing what the various things did, but somehow didn't think it was relevant to show us what any of those things would actually look like, at least not in any sort of centralized place. So I really like having these laid yeah, out for me quickly. That's a wonderful guide page. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to draw attention to the geography visualization. That's a great feature set that, you know, as you saw from the things I was talking about, there, there were so many that uh, it was already running very long. Uh, so I didn't even talk about geography visualization this time. Uh, I think possibly in a future stream, uh, you know, I'll devote a, a majority of, of time to actually talking about geography visualization. 
because there is so much cool functionality in that area. Oh yeah, quite a bit. You can see a lot of things that you can do with those. So it's it's all worth exploring, I would say. Yep. And uh, in natural language as well. So the, the guide pages um, show you how the Wolfram language is, is working and you can access uh, that, that computational power using these natural language inputs. So let's see, do we have any more questions at the moment? I see a few comments and- Exactly uh, what you wanted for data on countries such as places of oranges. Uh, yes, so lo looking at um, you know, all kinds of different data that's available, you can do some really cool lesson. Like, I, so I personally have never taught a course in economics, but after seeing all this functionality, I would love to do it, right? Yeah. So if, if you know any, uh, you know, people that teach economics, uh, be it at the high school or introductory college or even advanced college level, then they're looking for ways to visualize just giant complicated data sets. Uh, this is a great tool. Uh, it, it makes me wish I was an economics teacher, to be honest. Um. A feature that, let's see, we're a little over time, but um, a feature that I didn't have time to go into today, though, but I'll, I'll just shine a light on very briefly, mm -hmm. is the drawing tools. Let's see. Uh, Trying to make sure people can see the additional palette that's opening up. Can you see the drawing tools box that I'm dragging over now? Yes. Great, great. And this is something that will allow you to add elements in. Like for example, if I just deleted the height of that triangle, and if you had a diagram that you're saying, well, that triangle should really have a height in it. I can select the line tool and draw, just draw one in as it, <clears throat> excuse me. As it goes, I think, oh, I think this might be less receptive to, than usual because it's not in its own output cell. I, I just realized that all the times I've used the drawing tool before, I've been working on a graphic that I myself created, as opposed to one that's part of a step-by-step -step solution. So I'll find a good example to showcase that later. But the tool is there. It's not my go-to way of doing visualizations in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition or Mathematica, but I like that it's there. I like that I'm able to change elements of the visualizations of the drawings, if I want to emphasize something, label something, all of those things about it. Now, there, there are a lot of good programs out there for creating visualizations, but I love having one in the program where I'm actually doing my calculations, my explanations, because otherwise I've found if I want to be using those programs to create some sort of presentation, I have to be able to, <clears throat> See, it, seeing it, uh, uh, sorry, questions, I was just gonna say, I, the great advantage of the notebook format is that ability to mix graphics, computation, and text, right? Yep. So w when you have a notebook, you can bring all those into one place. Right. I could add screenshots of an, something I did in another program if I wanted, no problems there. But then if students were asking questions about, well, what happens if you change this? What happens if you edit that? I would not be able to do that live as I was going through it. I would have to um, get back to them later. And with this sort of thing, I can change it as I go. That's a, a feature that as an educator, I have liked in the past. And and just like with you know drawing tools, so Noah was saying that that was something that he personally prefers to use um, you know, a, a computational method rather than the, the graphic interface method. Um, I feel the same way about suggestions bar, right? Like you saw before, I had my suggestions bar, you know, minimized by default because I personally don't use it that often. But if you want that suggestions bar there, there's some people that love it, right? They use it all the time. And so just we're, depending on- We're actually on, going to be talking a lot about the suggestions bar in the next video. So if indeed, you're yes. curious about that, yep. stay tuned.
Yep. Stay tuned. You know, not stay t- tuned right <laughs> now. Today. It'll be it'll be a couple of weeks from now, but yes. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. see. There's maybe in another video we could illustrate how to animate shapes. Ah, yes, yes. Um, I think that would be a great thing to illustrate. Yeah, the, the animation abilities are really cool um, mm-hmm. because when, whenever you make a manipulate, in many ways is similar to an animation, but there are some subtle differences between like having a slider and having like a video, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I agree that would be a great thing for us to showcase. I totally mm-hmm. agree. I think um, for a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great visualizations of complete three-dimensional objects in the Wolfram demonstrations project. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely recommend yeah, I, checking that out. That, that, is a, that is a nice place to, to look just to get you started while you're waiting on us to, to sort of make a, a, a teaching uh, thing about it, but yes. Uh, any other things that people would really like to see? So I, I, this time we, we focused a lot mm-hmm. on visualization. Um, next time we're going to be showcasing suggestions bar and uh, a few other things now, uh, possibly including animations as well. Um, if there's any other stuff that people would really like to see, um, feel free to put that either in a, the chat now or in a comment below, and uh, we will definitely take a look and, and see what we can do there. Because yeah, like any any amount of of content that we show you about this tool is not going to be the entire amount of content that you could see, right? Because oh yeah. Stuff that you can do with computation is just mind-bogglingly large. So, you know, we're we're picking stuff that sort of we think is cool, that we think you'll think is cool. So, if there's anything that, you know, you're like, wait, can you do this? Let us know, uh, and and we'll make sure to make a note of that so that we can show you stuff that you think is cool as well. Mm-hmm. The it's it's worth remembering that the the symbol of Wolfram Research, John actually is wearing it on his shirt there where we call it the spiky is a reference to the early days of the Mathematica program where people just loved and honestly still do to play around with visualizations and see what sort of equations could create shapes that they would never have been able to just graph out by hand or it would have taken weeks or of work to be able to figure out how to do all of these things accurately. And th- with this computer, you can see all of these amazing expressions of ideas given form. I I love that. I, I think it's worth exploring. So I definitely encourage everybody explore, try something out, see what works, what doesn't, what changes things. That's what being into math and science is all about, isn't it? There's um, another cool thing that actually will take me just a moment to bring up um, because it, I only just thought of it, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, let me, yeah, sorry. No, if there's any other questions while I'm bringing this up real quick, because uh, it just occurred to me that I should. I'm checking the chat so far. Looks like we're we're covering what people are hoping we'll cover. Cool, good. Um, so let me share my screen. This will probably be the last example unless a, a flurry of questions come in because mm-hmm. we're a little over time already. So let me share. Okay, so um, another thing that I think is just great, right? So if, you know, there, there's a, you can plot complex functions and things like this too, right? You know, you, you can get, as advanced as you want to with the, the content that you're you're using in Wolfram Alpha Notebook Edition. And so um, when I was uh, you know working with complex plot the other day for something I was doing, uh, you know, you can read, can you see this this uh, documentation here? Yep. Great. So um, if you know I was reading because I had a question about how a particular thing was working. So under the, the basic applications, right? So the, the documentation, you reminded me of something that I completely forgot about complex functions, right? Where uh, the argument proceeds uh, counterclockwise around the zeros of a function. So in other words, if I have a function that has a complex function that has like one zero, 
the, the color wheel proceeds once around that. The color wheel is sort of uh, mapping what's called the argument of a complex function. If I have a complex function with a multiple zero, it you know proceeds multiple times around. I completely forgot that because it had been years until it had been years since that was relevant for something that I was doing. But uh, sure enough, I was reminded just by reading documentation of code. Right. So like the, the documentation is absolutely amazing, right? Because most people think documentation, they think, oh my gosh, that's a nightmare, it's boring. You know, reading code documentation is terrible, but not, not in this case, right? So if you're looking at the documentation, uh, either that's built in or so remember to get this, this is also what you can access online through the, the Wolfram Documentation Center, but you can also get to it through notebooks very easily. Um, so I've lost my place now, but uh, at any rate, the, the documentation isn't just about code, it also teaches you about the mathematics and things that the code is sort of helping you understand. Yeah, right? I mean, th thanks, thanks so much for pointing that out, John, because that's, that's a wonderful thing about all of this is that in this day and age of digital art, of AI created imagery, there's a lot of ways that computers are creating beautiful things for us to look at. But this is not a toy. This is not something that's just supposed to be neat. This is a tool for scientists, for educators, and we know that. Everything around it is built under those assumptions. I Today, I um, was looking at a way for to transfer a video game from one console to another. I won't say what the... Um, type of console was the company, but it's a video game provider that is notoriously known for children's material. And the documentation was horrifyingly confusing to me. I could barely, a grown person myself could barely understand it. I was thinking to myself, my goodness, if a kid had to interact with this, it would be just a disaster. I see this sort of thing all the time. I see documentation by companies that, that have are made by people who understand this material because they're experts, but they're writing it without any consideration for who is reading it, what it's mm -hmm. who is going to use it, what it's for. At at Wolfram, it's one of the things I'm the most proud about working for this company is how much everything is directed to you knowing what you're going to use it for knowing who you are knowing what you'd want to know about these things so i definitely would yeah. recommend read the manual is not a, a punishment in this case yeah. it's an opportunity yeah, not, not in this case in in, in many situations reading the oh, manual yeah. is like the many last thing you're, you're gonna do. but but no the, the documentation center is not just for getting into the the minutia of of code it, it's you know just a great resource no matter what you're into Okay, well, thanks a lot for joining us, everyone. Yes, and, thank uh, you. Looking forward to the next time we get to show you some more useful things about these programs. Yeah, we'll see you next.